I showed you just the final result of this, but I want to go over the calculation because, uh, again, I think it's an exercise you should do. What you want to do is uh, take this thing and dissect it into smaller parts. Okay, and this sort of uh, commutator algebra is a common thing in many body theory. Uh, so, you know, first you want actually the commutator instead of anti-commutator for fermion operators. And you can easily work out what that is, okay, using the anti-commutation relations from above. Then you want the commutator between a quadratic pair and another uh, fermion operator. And again, a couple of steps and you can work out what that is. And then finally, you will be able to work out this general element that appears in the sum. Okay, and what comes out is something that has a delta function and a pair of quadratic operators. Okay, so what I just want to point out about this calculation, okay, and then, then you know, a few more steps and you get this thing that I showed you. But what I want to point out about this calculation is the reason that it works is that there is a sort of closure property. Okay, the set of uh, the set of quadratic operators, quadratic second quantization operators, is closed under time evolution with a quadratic Hamiltonian. Okay, and that closure pro uh, that closure property allows you to do dynamics without uh, going outside the set of quadratic operators. Okay, and that's what makes this calculation efficient. Once you introduce a non-quadratic uh, Hamiltonian, this will break. Okay, you will no longer have you will no longer have this nice uh, quadratic operator on the right hand side, but you'll have some other terms. And as you continue to do this, you'll get more and more terms, and the whole thing will explode exponentially. The number of operators you need will explode exponentially. You'll get infinite order operators, and everything goes to crap. Okay, and that's where many body physics becomes hard. So this sort of trick only works for non-interacting systems. Uh, okay, that is one thing I just wanted to point out. As I said, uh, a non-quadratic Hamiltonian will screw you over because you'll start generating a lot of uh, higher order terms. But actually, if you want to evaluate non-quadratic operators, then this is quite simple as long as your Hamiltonian is non-quadratic. Uh, so what happens is that you have Wick's theorem, which James also mentioned before. So what you can always do in a non-interacting system is write some sort of okay, if you have some high order operator string, okay, you can always write this as a sum over low order operator strings. Okay, you can also do this with Green's functions. So have you guys seen this before? Who has seen this? Really? Okay, so a few of you. Okay, but what we can always do is essentially sum over permutations. Okay, so in order to get a non-zero contribution out of a term like this, every A dagger has to be paired with an A. Okay, and there are two possible pairings. I can be paired with L and then J goes with K. Or you can do this. Okay, so you sum up these terms. They get a sign that has to do with the fermion anti-commutation relations. And essentially, uh, you have a term which looks like A dagger I, A J, A dagger K, A L. And you have another term that looks like A dagger I, A L, A dagger uh, K, A J. Okay? So these have to do with these two pairings of the creation and annihilation operators. They have a sign associated with them. And if you have uh, 2n pairs of creation and uh, sorry, 2n operators, half of them have to be creation and half of them have to be annihilation operators in order to get a non-zero contribution uh, for particle number conserving Hamiltonian, then uh, you will have n factorial terms like this. 
and you can sum them all up as a determinant. Okay, so you can sum up the n factorial terms in n to the third computational time, and everything stays polynomial. Okay, so this is actually an important thing about non-interacting physics, and it's actually used uh, later on about getting uh, interacting physics out of it, okay, from perturbation theory and things like that. Okay, so this is just Wick's theorem. Okay, and what you should see at this point is that even if you want something like that, you can get it out of the dynamics of these things that we've already calculated. The easiest systems to systems which are the most uh, difficult, right? So, so we'll do exact diagonalization. So what I want to do now is write uh, sort of a brute force method for evaluating uh, fermionic Hamiltonians. We're going to connect it to the spin language, once again, to have that connection to quantum information. And I think this is sort of interesting to look at. And uh, uh, who here has actually done exact diagonalization or knows what I'm talking about? Okay, we have one, two, three, four. Okay, the rest of you have not. Who here knows what it is? Who doesn't know what it is? Okay. So once again, that was not a projection operator, but uh, thank you for your honesty. Uh, so, okay, good. So what I want to do now, okay, in order to work with uh, second quantization operators on a computer, we want to be able to write them as matrices. Once we actually have them in matrix form, then we can do everything uh, we do with the matrix very efficiently. And we can also do it in high level languages because we have matrix operations implemented efficiently. Okay, so we don't have to write complex code. And once again, this is something that can be done in a simple Python script. So I want to represent uh, an A dagger or an A as a matrix. Okay, now of course it has to be a matrix in the Hilbert space, so the size of the matrix is going to be exponential, and that means that this method is going to be limited to small systems. Okay, there's only so much I can push it. Uh, nevertheless, it can be useful, and uh, you know there are tricks to push it further than you would think. And this uh, is the basis of all other methods, which uh, are no longer exact, but take part of the Hilbert space and try to work out what the important part of the Hilbert space is uh, in order to get past this exponent. And this will be things like matrix product states, which I will at least discuss a little bit. Okay, so let's do the following thing. Now let's start with a single A dagger, okay? And I want to have a notation where uh, Right, this, this will be my general notation. This will be the site number, and this will be the total number of sites. Okay, so I'm going to write an operator, a creation operator, for site M out of big M sites. And this has no, what I'm doing now has no dependence on the form of the Hamiltonian, the geometry of the problem, or something like that. It's just a way to generate a set of matrices that have the properties that I want from creation and uh, annihilation operators. Okay, so let's start with a dagger one one. Okay, so I have a system with one orbital, one site. Okay, once again we're throwing away spin. Spin will be like a site. Okay, and I want to act on it uh, with a creation operator. So let's first define our basis, right? So we can have something like unoccupied will be want to be consistent. Yeah. So this will be unoccupied and this will be occupied. Okay. Uh, and these two things span uh, Hilbert space, which has one zero electron, right? One zero particle state and one one particle state. Okay, so two-dimensional Hilbert space, very simple. 
Okay, what do I want my creation operator to do? When it's acting on my unoccupied state, I want it to give me my occupied state. And in all other cases, I want it to give me zero. Okay, so you should be very easily able to convince yourself that this is this matrix. Okay. This matrix is the same as sigma plus, right? If I were looking at a spin Hamiltonian. Okay, in order for the to be sigma plus, for sigma plus to correspond to a dagger, I define them in this weird order. Okay, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, similarly, I can define a one one equals. 0, 0, 1, 0 equals sigma minus. OK, so now, now I have single, single site operators, and I want to take them and extend them to more sites. So let's construct a dagger 1 for two sites. OK, and the easiest way to do that is with a, uh, a, uh, an outer product or a Kronecker product. Okay, so what I want is to write an operator that acts on site one and doesn't do anything to site two. So it's going to be something like sigma plus on site one times an identity operator on site two. Okay, and similarly for A. Okay, so now what is a dagger 2 2? Okay, yeah, you answered two different things. Let me write first this one. Okay, i times sigma plus. Okay, so who thinks this is correct? OK, yeah, you said it, so yeah. OK, so yeah, so obviously I wouldn't ask that if it wasn't actually incorrect, right? But it seems sort of intuitive, right? Because this is an operator that acts on the uh, second site and raises it. OK, so why is it not correct? That's right, OK. So this is not going to obey uh, the fermionic anti-commutation rules. It turns out that if you wanted to obey them, what you have to do is put a spin sigma z operator here. Okay, and then it's a very simple exercise to convince yourself that this works. Okay? So, given this, we'll do sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, physicist induction, which is, uh, you know, it, it works for n equals 1, it works for n equals 2, therefore it works for general n, okay? <laughs> and I can write a general a dagger m, big M, as something like this. Sigma z, outer product, so on. Sigma z, then sigma plus, then identity operators. Okay, so a fermionic operator in spin language comes with a string of spin operators. Okay, in this spin language that we use in quantum information, it's a very non-local operator. It actually, right, it actually can operate on all the sites in the system, even though it's only changing one fermion. Okay, so this is weird, uh, and this uh, often breaks the analogies between spins and fermions, but uh, yeah, that, that's the way that it works. Okay. So, uh, given this, uh, this is actually almost everything we need in order to implement this kind of thing on a computer. 
Okay, so most uh, modern languages will give you something like uh, this outer product. And you can construct small matrices and start building bigger matrices out of them. And uh, uh, this works to some degree, right? Because eventually the matrices become too big. Once we have this, uh, we can use this same approach to do dynamics. And it actually is quite uh, trivial, right? So we have this wave function written in this, uh, this exact diagonalization language, right? What does that mean? The data that we actually have is always a vector, okay? A vector of exponential size, two to the number of, uh, of uh, orbitals, of spin orbitals, okay? So we can always represent this uh, in this way that I've written before, right? N1, Nm. Okay, so, right, so this guy is called the Fox state. And it's a basis, an occupation basis for the system. And what you can do is you can uh, uh, create a mapping between a string and of zeros and ones and a uh, unit vector, right? A standard basis vector in your many body space. Okay, and this will be useful when you're doing exact diagonalizations a lot. So I'll, I'll show you in a bit one way to do it. But you find yourself often converting between the representation of this guy, right? So this guy is always going to be some one zero zero, right? Something like that, something like the computational basis in quantum information. But it's, it also corresponds to some vector like this, which has just one, which has one in just one place along it. Okay, and you need to be able to convert back and forth between these things. Once you have that conversion, then this is just, right, your wave function is just a set of Cs. Okay, arranged according to some order. And that order is determined by uh, basically the uh, order in which you did, did these Kronecker products. Okay, so you have to be consistent in the way that you do that. And if you do it in a particular way, you'll get the order that you find intuitive. Okay, so once again, I'll show you an example, show you that we can do that. But this takes a little bit of playing around with to get right. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so now that you have this thing, uh, you can just act on it with any operator. Okay, so for instance, I have this operator a dagger three for the same uh, for the same system size, and that's going to be an operator of the same dimensionality, right? A matrix of the same dimensionality as this vector. Okay, so if this is two to the m, a two to the m length vector, I'll have a two to the m times two to the m matrix that can act on it. And then I can take this wave function and see what happens when I create a fermion on site uh, three. Okay, similarly, I can act on it with the Hamiltonian. Okay, so if I want to calculate the energy of a state, for instance, okay, then I can do something like this. Okay, and that's going to be something like psi the vector, right? So this is as a Rho vector, H as a matrix, and Psi as a column vector. Where here it has to be, right, it has to be complex conjugate. So you have a matrix vector product that gives you a vector times a vector, scalar product, you get a number. Okay. So similarly, we can calculate any other operator, local or global, all this stuff, right? The, the nice thing about this exact diagonalization is that all the information is in here, okay? You can really calculate whatever you want because the wave function contains all the information. The price is that you have, you know, an exponentially large object to deal with. 
Okay, now if you want to do time propagation, then essentially what you need to do is act on this guy with the time propagation operator. And that is, there are two main kinds of things that you do with that. You can do that in uh, imaginary time in order to extract ground states in order to get finite temperature properties. And you can do that in real time in order to really propagate in time. Okay, so if you want to do time propagation, then you need something like this. Okay, and you want to act on the state. So this is a matrix. Okay, so what you do is you take your H matrix, you diagonalize it. Okay, you get a diagonal matrix of 2 to the m times 2 to the m. Okay, let's call it D. Okay. You have right, something like this is the, you know, the transformation that diagonalized your Hamiltonian. So you can now do e to minus i h t equals t dagger e to d. This is easy to calculate because it's a diagonal matrix times t. And you have a matrix that can time propagate your Hamiltonian. So you just multiply your vector by that matrix, and you have time propagation. If you have a time-independent Hamiltonian, you only need to calculate that once for some delta t, and then you can jump forward in hops of that delta t. If you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, then you have to do that for each small interval separately. Okay, and once again, you can do things like this Magnus expansion. You can do higher-order things. Uh, there are things that you can do that use the nature of the Hamiltonian to do this more efficiently. So there is a technique called Trotter splitting, where if your Hamiltonian is composed of local operators, you, you can split it up into, into smaller bits that make this process more efficient. Okay, but in, in principle, this is all there is to it. Okay, so once you have your Hamiltonian as a matrix, uh, right, you diagonalize it and you do whatever you want with the system. Okay, everything is super simple in principle. In practice, because these matrices are huge, then eventually you start doing other things in order to, to gain more out of them. Okay, so one thing is that this matrix is extremely sparse. Okay, so you can tell, uh, right, if you look at the way that we generated the A's and A daggers, you can tell that uh, most of what they are is these local uh, operators that are mostly zeros and maybe one in one place or another. So if you look at the full space of this thing, most of those things is a zero. If your Hamiltonian is constructed of local operators like that, then most of your Hamiltonian is going to be a zero. And we will actually examine one pretty soon, and we'll look at this sparseness. So there are numerical techniques for working with sparse matrices. Okay, a sparse matrix, you don't have to store all those zeros. That's a waste of, uh, a waste of storage. And you don't have to use those zeros for performing uh, uh, matrix vector products. Okay, there are techniques uh, like a Lanchos algorithm is one well-known thing. For uh, without ever uh, writing down a Hamiltonian, applying an exponent of the Hamiltonian to a vector. Okay, so these are all sorts of ways by which we can go farther than uh, what we might think. But again, eventually there's an exponent and we're going to be limited. Okay. So is this more or less clear? Like, do you think you, uh, you guys think you could go ahead and code this up if you wanted to? Who thinks yes? Okay, that's a pretty good number. So what I want to do now is uh, examine a code that does this. Okay, and we'll go over it. You'll see that it's not as pretty as the non-interacting code. Okay, part of that is because I was lazier when I wrote it. Another part of that is just because it's a little bit more uh, involved. Okay, so what I'm doing is almost the same model. Okay, but uh, I've added spin and I've added a Hubbard type interaction. Okay, so I'll write it down.
Okay, so I have a sum over my sites of epsilon times occupation on the site plus a sum over my sites of uh, coupling to the next site. plus a sum over my sites of a local interaction term. Okay, now what I should do, right, all of these are also sums over spin. All of these operators have a spin index. Okay, and all these terms are spin diagonal, but the interaction is not. Okay, so this has an i up and i down. So Hubbard interaction is site diagonal, okay, but spin non-diagonal. So if I have two electrons of opposite spin on the same site, that's associated with an energy cost of u. Okay, and it's sort of like the simplest model of many-body interaction that you, you will encounter. Oops. Okay, so let's build some operators. Okay, the way that I did this, and you don't have to do it exactly this way, this is just for convenience, is that I set up a dictionary of local operators on the site. Okay, so on my site I define uh, D and D dagger. Okay, I, I, I seem to switch between D and A notation for the operators, okay, but I mean the same thing for both up and down. Okay, and each one of these is a 4 by 4 matrix, okay, because we're talking about one site that has two spins. And uh, I set these up according to exactly the rules that we saw before. Okay, then I define a set of strings, okay, that define the local Fox betas on the side. Okay, and this is the order in which I want them defined. Okay, I did this in lexicographic order. This is more convenient to use later. Okay, so that, that gives me everything I need for one site with two spins. Now I want to set up a set of global operators, okay, for all the sites. So I start with a copy of my local operators, and I also set up local strings, which start as a copy of my local strings describing my state. And then uh, for each Right? For each uh, site number, I create a new string, okay, just by adding the end of the old string, right? the possible ends of the old string to the new string. And I create new operators with this handy Python function, which is just a Kronecker product. Okay, so this is like this uh, circle product of two things. So if I give it two 4 by 4 operators, it produces a 16 by 16 operator, uh, sorry, matrix, that represents the Kronecker product of these things. Okay, and I do this exactly according to the rules that I wrote before. So what I do is I take the previous, uh, I, I, I take, yeah, well, okay, I think that's sort of clear enough. And uh, I, I do this in a way that I have, right, I call this P, but this is like a sigma Z on the left and uh, identities on the right. Okay, and I, I use this process, which you can go into uh, later in order to construct all these things. And when I'm done, I enumerate all my strings and I save a dictionary. Okay, a dictionary or hash table is this nice, uh, this nice data structure that is built into Python, but you can also find it in other languages, uh, where as an index I can give it every, anything I want, okay? I can give it a string or a number, and it'll store something in that index. So for each Fox string, okay, a sequence of zeros and ones, it'll give me a number of the vector and the basis that has that, that, that corresponds to that state, and vice versa. 
Okay, so I have a way to convert to convert between vectors and uh, Fox state descriptions. Okay, so once once this little sequence is run, I have all my A's and A daggers ready. And uh, oops. And uh, and now I can use them to construct the Hamiltonian. Okay, so the Hamiltonian is a 4 to the power of m matrix, right? Because each side has two spins. And I construct it out of these operators. So let's look at what goes on here. For the non-interacting part, I get dm and d dagger m for each spin. And the Hamiltonian, I just add to that epsilon times d dagger d for every site and every spin. Okay, and I've written that very explicitly just so you can see what it looks like. Similarly, there's this uh, coupling term with the T. Okay, so I, I pick out those operators out of my list, my global list of operators, and I just do matrix products here, matrix products and sum. Okay, so as you can see, there's really nothing sophisticated here, okay, because all these are matrices of the same size, and you just have represented an operator by a matrix. Okay, and this thing doesn't really care about whether it's interacting or not. It's just as easy to represent the interacting, the non-quadratic part, as it is the quadratic part. It's just the product of four operators instead of two operators. Okay, so given that, uh, I can take my Hamiltonian, okay, that I've constructed here, and I can actually just plot that matrix. Okay, so I'll zoom out a little bit. Okay, and uh, I think you can see very little of what goes on here because of the screen. But, uh, okay, I set up this color scheme so that gray is zeros. So what you can see is that almost all of this is gray. There is a line along the diagonal, which is not gray. Okay, and off of the diagonal, I wonder if you can even see this in the light. But do you see so these very small strips of red? You should be able to sort of make them out. Okay, but there's not much of them. Okay, so yeah, so the color scheme is not great, at least for a projector. Can you see that? <laughs> sort of. But uh, essentially, uh, <coughs> what this tells you is that this is almost entirely zeros. Okay, so it's actually quite wasteful to store this as a dense matrix, but I mean, we're not going for performance here, we're going for simplicity, okay? And uh, you can really gain a lot from sparse matrix techniques. Okay, so once we have the Hamiltonian, we can diagonalize it, okay? Exact diagonalization. So again, any uh, modern language will just have something that can do this in one line. Okay, so this gives me the eigenvalues and this uh, unitary that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. And then I can plot the set of energies that come out of this. Okay, now uh, this is sometimes called the many-body spectrum. Okay, this is not what we think of as the spectral function or as a spectrum that you would measure in an experiment. This is the set of many-body energies of the Hamiltonian. So how is that different from the spectrum? The spectrum has to do with some excitation, right? You're trying to uh, excite the system at some frequency, and you're seeing whether it can absorb or uh, electrons or holes, for instance, at that frequency. Okay, so that is like a Green's function, what is called a spectral function. Uh, but OK, one, one thing we can observe about this guy is that you see that there are these plateaus here where it's flat. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Degeneracy. Degeneracy, yeah. So why is there degeneracy here? What does it mean that there's degeneracy? There are some symmetries. Yep, yeah, that's right. So there, this system has some symmetries that we didn't account for. Okay? And we can start working out what they are. Uh, th there are actually quite a few symmetries. There's a local SU2 symmetry that has to do with just the, the way the sites are constructed. 
and there are global symmetries, uh, there are conserved numbers, the total number of, uh, of uh, particles of each spin is conserved by the Hamiltonian. And what you could do in principle is do a group theory analysis on this thing and take this, right, this big Hamiltonian and make it block diagonal. So you could separate it into smaller blocks, okay, each one of which takes advantage of all the symmetries. And if you do that, uh, then that is good, right? Because it takes, uh, right, the cost of diagonalizing a matrix is its size to the third. So if you divide it into some number of smaller matrices, then you're substantially uh, easing your cost of calculation. And in fact, in a real exact diagonalization code, right, if you do this seriously for numerics, one of the biggest things is to take care of what's called quantum numbers in this context, which is essentially symmetries. So every possible symmetry you can take advantage of, you want to do that, and you will get a more efficient calculation. If I haven't done that, then I'm going to see degeneracy in my many-body spectrum. Okay. Uh, now we can play with this a little bit. Sorry, so you want to say if you make a block diagonal matrix, you will not see degeneracy? Uh, if I make, yeah, if, if I look at each block separately and I use yeah, all possible symmetries, then I shouldn't see degeneracy, right? Unless there's accidental, uh, right? Uh, there's what's called accidental degeneracy, which we say is not related to symmetry, but it may just be that you don't know the symmetry or it's a hidden symmetry or something like that. So mm. it's a way of but saying that, that there's a symmetry that we, we don't know of or something. But generally, we want to see degeneracy because they're physical. Or Ah, uh, yeah, so the system has a physical, has physical degeneracies. So we don't want to get rid of them because we lose information about Well, I mean, it depends what we want. Okay, we want this information, but the fact that I'm diagonalizing this whole matrix at once is wasteful, right? This costs me more than it should. So if I, if I was looking to do as big a problem as possible, right, it would help out to break it into smaller blocks and do each one individually. I would still have all the information, I would just have it already in a block diagonal form. Okay. It doesn't get erased, it just gets uh, sort of used. And here I'm not taking advantage of it. Uh, now, one thing which is interesting here is to compare, right, I can very easily turn this from an interacting problem. Okay, see here I chose this U, this many body energy to be four, but I can set it to zero. Okay, and once I do that, I am solving a non-interacting problem. Okay, so let's run that. Doesn't produce as obvious a result as I thought it would. Uh, okay, we can do something else though. Let's set t to zero for a moment. Okay, so what is t? t is like the kinetic energy term. Okay, it's what lets electrons go from site to site. So if I remove that, then the problem becomes sort of trivial. Is this maybe? Oh, yeah, here we go. So you see that now I have tons of degeneracy. Okay, so why is that? Let's try to understand this. So this is a system that has a bunch of sites. Okay, and each one can have uh, zero, one, or two electrons. Okay. And the electrons actually cannot move between the sites anymore. So there's no option of delocalization. If I add this T, then you can have states like this, which sort of delocalize over the whole thing and save some energy. Now they can't do that. So now all the states are essentially like this pigeonhole thing. I have to take whatever number of electrons I have and put them in, the, in my states. So I can uh, write, if I have this with, uh, say, uh, four sites, then I have one state with zero electrons, which has some given energy. But I have four identical states with one electron. I can put my one electron here, 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 or here. Right? And I have 16 states where I put two electrons, uh, sorry, not 16, but 12 states where I put two electrons on two different sites. And four states where I put two electrons on the same site. Okay, so you see that all, all the sites I can generate have massive degeneracy. And this is why you see these, but actually there's, there's a very small number of energies in total that yeah, are generated. Uh, well, uh, maybe in just a minute. Okay. okay. Okay, so, well, maybe I'll just say that 
once we have this set of energies, then as I wrote before, it's very easy to construct a time evolution operator. Uh, so what we'll do in the, f in the next part, in the beginning of the next part, is we'll construct actually imaginary and real-time propagation operators, and we'll try to solve this uh, little uh, quantum quench problem. Okay, and we'll see that this is very easy with this method. Uh, but again, of course, we'll only be able to do it for a small system. So, uh, oh, okay, let's take a break. Okay, so we have diagonalized our Hamiltonian. Okay, we have its many-body spectrum. And now uh, I'm, I'm going to do a little simulation. Okay, and this is just a randomly chosen thing to illustrate some principles. But, uh, okay, so what do we have here? I have some function which is given a Fox state. Okay, and will return, uh, it will assemble like the population of up and down for that state. Okay, I have another function which is given a wave function. Okay, and this is, uh, okay, I got a little lazy about writing this. Okay, but it will also eventually return the up and down occupation for that state. Okay, and it uses this function because what it does is it looks at that state, it has the list of coefficients, and it sums up, right, this might be a little ugly to read, but this is essentially the coefficient squared for a particular Fox state times the Fox state occupation corresponding to that, uh, that basis state. Okay, so this is you know, a very simple way to evaluate uh, something like that. Uh, uh, why am I doing this? Does the argument C come all the way to the end? I guess. I didn't see it yet. Uh, yeah, so this is a really long line. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so this depends on Psi. Yeah, so this, uh, I, I should clean it up before I give it to you guys, but uh, well, we'll see if I do. Uh, I'll put it on some GitHub repo, and you're, you're welcome to improve it. That would be nice. Okay, so what I'm going to do with this is uh, get an initial state. Okay, so if I do dynamics, I want an initial state to start from. And I want to start with a non-trivial initial state. So with the non-interacting, uh, what we did was start from uh, every other site is occupied. Okay, which is fine. Again, it's just uh, an arbitrary thing we did to illustrate some principles. But what I want to do now is start from the ground state, okay, perturb the system, and then propagate onwards, okay, which is something that you actually see, uh, like, th this is an interesting thing to do in a lot of scientific applications. Uh, so starting from the ground state, well, what does that mean? Okay, because this system has some ground state, okay, it has some lowest energy, uh, but that's probably not the energy that we want. Okay, why is that? Because it's probably the empty state, exactly. Okay, so, so what we want is something like a ground state with a particular number of electrons. Okay, like maybe the half-filled uh, equal spin occupation ground state, something like that. Okay, and that's more well-defined. And in order to get that, uh, well, there are several approaches to do that. Okay, the efficient approach, okay, the way that will really take advantage of everything, is to do this uh, block diagonal thing that I discussed, okay, to use the uh, symmetry properties of the Hamiltonian to generate a block that has only states with, uh, uh, you know, half occupation, same spin occupation, and then get the lowest energy state from within that block. Okay? I'm going to do it the lazy way. Okay? I'm going to take advantage of the fact that any sort of time propagation that I do will conserve symmetries. Okay? Otherwise, they are not symmetries. Right? So, what I will do is I will start from some state which has uh, the occupation that I want. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll set all my, uh, 
right? Uh, my system has some number of sites. Okay. Oh, okay, here are my sites. So what I'll do is I'll set uh, this one to be doubly occupied, this one to be unoccupied, this one to be doubly occupied, and so on. Okay, I'm not actually going to do that many, but uh, okay, so if I do this for an even number of sites, right, if it's not even, then I can't have half occupation, then this will give me a state that has three up electrons and three down electrons and six sites, which is what I want. Okay, this is clearly not going to be the ground state, right? This is just a random state with probably, right, not a well-defined energy even, it's not an eigenstate, it's going to be quite high up in energy. Oops. So, but, but it is certainly in the right symmetry block, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that state and propagate it in imaginary time until I get to the ground state within that block. Okay, why does that work? The, does everyone, okay, who knows why that works? Okay, who is asleep and not paying attention to me? Okay, but you also know how that works, so that's, uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know your picture, so. <laughs> you don't know what? Your picture, this, this, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, this, uh, uh, how do you cut environment you are working with? Oh, it's a, it's a Hubbard model. Yeah, Hubbard model, I know. Yeah, but, okay. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you don't know Jupiter, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. This is like a web-based notebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's very nice. I know about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is part of how this replaces uh, cat thematica. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the way it works is like this, right? Any state that you have is written as a sum over, right, all the many body states times uh, some coefficients time, you know, some notation for what that state is. Okay, if all my states are in a particular symmetry block, then uh, this will be composed only of uh, states that have that symmetry. Okay, if it's outside the block, then, uh, you know, the, right, the, the, the property of a symmetry block is that it's conserved under time propagation and things like this, so if I have one thing outside the block, then eventually everything will go outside the block. Okay. Now, if I act on this thing with uh, not a regular time propagation operator, but a, something like a thermal time propagation order, okay? Uh, e to minus tau times h, okay, as opposed to e to i t times h. Okay, what, this, what will this do? Okay, if these are all eigenstates, then this is going to give me uh, sum over alpha in the block, e to minus the energy of state alpha times tau uh, times the coefficient times alpha. Okay, so this reduces, right, the coefficient, right, it's like a transformation between C alphas and new C alphas, where each coefficient is reduced by an exponential factor, but the lowest energy coefficient is reduced uh, by the smallest amount. Okay, it's reduced the least. So after I do this, I will normalize my wave function. Okay, I will get a new wave function that, uh, you know, that the sum of the squares of the coefficient sum to one, and then I will repeat this process. Okay, and every time I do this, all my states, except the ground state within the block, are going to become smaller and smaller until eventually they're exponentially small, and I'm left with the ground state. Okay, so this is a very conceptually simple way to find either a complete ground state of a Hamiltonian or a ground state within a specific block. Okay, and uh, this is what I do. So I construct, right, you see this is, E is the energies, right, so this is the exponent of a vector. So, you know, it, and this constructs a diagonal matrix which along the diagonal you have that vector. Okay, and then I have these uh, unitary matrices which take me back to the regular basis where the Hamiltonian is not diagonal. 
And I've constructed in one line an imaginary time propagation operator. And then for 100 iterations, doesn't matter, okay? I uh, apply this propagator to my wave function. I normalize my wave function, okay, by dividing by the square root, right, by its norm. And I calculate, right, I, I gather up the changes from the previous iteration, okay, the change in norm of my wave function from the previous iteration. This is to see whether I'm converged because I want to stop this process at some point. So I could use this as a stopping condition. Instead of doing 100 uh, iterations, I could just go until this change is small enough. But instead of that, I'm just going to do 100 iterations and plot, right, do this convergence plot. Okay, so this is a log scale. Okay, so what you see is that it converges exponentially, which is what we expect. So the change gets smaller and smaller until eventually you get this garbage. What is this garbage? Why does it stop converging here? Precision. Yep, so this is numerical precision, okay? So again, remember, we're not doing analytics, we're doing numerics, and this is where you run up against the limit of numerics. Numbers which are 10 to minus 15 on a computer in double precision don't mean anything, okay? They are not real numbers, you can consider them zero for all intents and purposes, and if the results of what you're doing depend on those numbers, then you are producing garbage, okay? So for all intents and purposes, this is zero, okay? We cannot go further from this without, again, without doing special things. So there are high precision uh, uh, libraries that you can use, and it's actually quite easy to do in Python, but it becomes much slower. Okay, so uh, we now have an initial state, okay? My Psi zero after I did this is the ground state of that particular symmetry block. And uh, what I did at the end is calculate the occupation of the two states for that supposed ground state. Okay, and you can see that, again, within numerical precision, uh, this is still, right, I, I have four sites total in my system, so I have two spins of each type. So this is what I wanted, and this process uh, did not break any symmetries, okay, which is good. This is a nice sanity check to have. Okay. So now I'm going to do some dynamics. So what will we do? Uh, our observable will be the uh, magnetization at site 1. Okay, so what is the magnetization at site 1? Okay, this is just N1 up minus N1 down. Okay. A local magnetization. And like any upper operator, I just construct it out of my, right, as matrix products of my operators, all of which are just regular matrices. So there's nothing special here. This is just like we constructed the Hamiltonian. And given that, uh, I construct a modified wave function, which is my. Uh, block ground state and at time zero I apply a d dagger up at site zero. Okay, so I start from the ground state and then I add an electron at site zero of spin up. Okay, I normalize this, we want it normalized and then I construct a real propagator exactly as I constructed the imaginary time propagator except instead of minus tau I have minus 1j times some delta time. Okay, and again, I only have to do this once. This matrix for time-independent Hamiltonian is the same throughout the calculation. And then I just essentially, uh, right, to measure my operator, I do Psi dagger times my magnetization operator times Psi, okay? And then I propagate in real time. Do, repeat, that's it. Okay, and then I plot it, and we have magnetization dynamics, <coughs> okay? Again, is this interesting physics? I, I don't know, probably not particularly, but you can do this for any Hamiltonian you like, for any problem you like, okay? And this, this just works, okay? It's a great test of anything you do. 
Okay, if you have any sort of theory, you can test it in the case of a small system. And this is a very rigorous test. And you can do dynamics with, uh, with very few errors, and it's, it's, it's quite nice. So what, where, where does this become problematic? I did it for four sites. OK. Uh, let's rerun the whole thing, see how long it takes. OK. It took, I don't know how long, like less than a second. OK. And this is running right here on my laptop. Now let's do five sites. Yeah, I broke something. It says that uh, it works only for even something. Oh, right. That, that does make sense. Yeah, so I can't do five. Let's do six. Thank you. OK, so it is actually still running. Are you using sparse matrices? No. This is all dense matrices. OK, so how does this scale? This whole thing should scale like uh, the exponent of the number of sites to the third. OK, so going from four to six sites, uh, right, it's still working, but this is not good for my laptop. OK, like I'm not even sure that it'll finish. OK, so the point of this is, yeah, I'm going to stop it. Okay. Can you hear that? That's the fan going on. So if you do this, you will very quickly destroy your laptop. Okay, now let's do the same thing with the non-interacting calculation. So if I do this right here, I do it for 10 sites. Okay, it takes this long. And now I do it for, say, 50 sites. It takes this long. Okay, and the main thing I think is to plot this legend, which has too many sites in it. <laughs> and if I do it for, let's try 500 sites, this is already not so easy, right? Because we're still diagonalizing a matrix, but uh, it should work. So. Does it fit in the RAM? Does it what? The fit in the memory? The yeah, yeah. It's just 500 square, right? This is not so bad. Okay, it doesn't like uh, 500 sites, but uh, yeah. I wonder at which stage it actually is. Okay, so I was a little bit ambitious still. And I think that it's still running the exact diagonalization in the background. Maybe that's why it's slow. But uh, well, yeah, you get the idea. So at least, right. 100 was not so difficult, dead kernel. So, yeah, it, it might just be that this is, uh, right, that this plot with the legend is killing it. So the point is that you can very easily scale up to large systems in the non-interacting thing, but uh, going from four to six sites in the exact diagonalization, probably requires, uh, say, going to sparse matrices or something like this. OK, so it is uh, substantially more technically involved. And uh, uh, nevertheless, right, for small systems, you have these benchmarks which are super easy to code. So it's a good way to practice doing somewhat more complicated numerics in cases where you really know the exact answer, right, because th those more complicated things should still work for four sites. They should just work faster. So it's a good, uh, it's a good thing to play with, and it's something to have. And uh, you know, any sort of project you do, you can find some excuse to use this. I think. Okay, so going from non-interacting to interacting systems is, is really terrible, right? And it's right this this sort of demonstration of how. You go from being able to do a lot to being able to do very little is somewhat disheartening. But uh, this is really because we're, we're sort of going fully brute force, head against the wall. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like that, OK? 
So this may be necessary if you want to do com quantum computation, right? The whole idea of quantum computation is to take advantage of that whole exponential phase space, right? And squeeze every bit of efficiency out of it. But if you're doing physics, then we often at least believe that we're not using the full exponential complexity of that uh, Hilbert space. Okay, so there's a term that the DMRG people uh, use, which is the illusion of the exponential uh, size of the Hilbert space. They say that actually interesting physics lives in a small corner. Okay, by interesting physics, like, like everyone who has a method, interesting physics is uh, the physics that my method can solve. So this is uh, a little, uh, right, like uh, the RG people will tell you that non-universal physics is completely uninteresting, right? Everyone only cares about universal properties. Everything else is just like little details and things. Okay, so nobody wants to know what TC is in high TC superconductors. They actually just want to know the, right, the uh, power of the, uh, the way the correlation length scales next to it when you change the temperature really close to it. That's, yeah. So, you know, that, uh, th this can get a little bit ridiculous, but uh, uh, nevertheless, for, for a pretty big class of systems, uh, there are good ansatzes, okay? approximate compressed representations of the wave function that have the property that A, they provide a good representation of the wave function or density matrix in some range of, uh, for some range of Hamiltonians of physical parameters that we care about, and B, they are uh, numerically easy to work with. Okay, they're computationally efficient. So if I have a really good ansatz, but it takes an exponential amount of computer time to apply an operator to it, and that's not going to be good. Okay, so both the uh, amount of data has to be small, and the algorithms for applying uh, quantum mechanics to it have to be, uh, uh, have to scale well with the system size. And there are very nice uh, cases like this. One of the most famous is, is started in condensed matter as a density matrix renormalization group, uh, which Steve White did. And actually, uh, in later years, it evolved together with the quantum information people into matrix product states. So now this quantum information language for this idea that originally came from, from renormalization group uh, type ideas, uh, right? The, the quantum information language is the way that we think of it these days. And it's actually been very helpful. Like it's helped improve the algorithms and it's helped us understand what's going on and it's really quite nice. So I, I, I guess I will do this tomorrow, but uh, yeah. But what we'll see is that instead of working with that full, uh, you know, giant uh, set of coefficients that describe a wave function, we can work with some smaller set of objects that tell us uh, enough about the wave function in some set of cases.